the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Welcome back listeners. We're with Dr. Silverberg and we're talking about trauma imaging. Last episode we talked about rotator cuffs, so let's let's go forward with that a little bit. You touched on this a little bit with the MR arthrograms, and you had some discussion about using it for labral pathology, the shoulder and the hip. Can you tell us about that a little bit? This kind of, I guess, is part of the technical part of part one we didn't go over, but that's okay. We can throw it in now and how it's relevant. You know, when would you use an MR arthrogram and why it's important to be able to find labral tears or or anything for that matter. And I didn't really want to go so much into IV contrast and, you know, scar tissue versus not. But if if you want to talk about that, that would be good too. Talking about labra, we're going to go back to kind of our our sequence selection. So fibrocartilage, labra and uh, menisci are dark on all sequences. So the issue isn't necessarily having sequence selection be a, a, a problem because we're always going to look at fibrocartilage on a fluid sense of sequence. The issue is their size. Take the hip, for example. The acetabular labrum is a small structure, and to adequately visualize it, we need small images. Not to delve too much into physics, but the smaller an image on MRI, the worse the image is going to appear, unfortunately. So as we try to image these smaller structures, we have less ability to do so well the smaller we get. When we look for a labral tear, again, we're looking at a dark labrum on a fluid sense sequence, and we're looking for a bright signal in that, in that tear. Now, one contrast to our rotator cuff pathology, the signal intensity in a labrum or a meniscus does not have to be equal to fluid to be a tear. So that is one difference I do want to mention. However, tears can be co-opted, meaning the two flaps of the tear are sitting on top of each other. And that bright signal may not be apparent, especially at the size in which we're looking at the labrum. Think about Google, Google Maps. If you zoom out to look at your house, but you're looking from space, it's hard to see it. But if you zoom into your street level, it's easy to see it. That's the same thing with labral tears. If we're imaging in a very large field of view, it's going to be hard to pick up labral tears. We want to go for a smaller field of view. One way we can sort of make up for the decrease in the ability to see signal in the labrum, or abnormal signal labrum, is by giving something that is extremely bright that will go into the labrum that we can see. And that is contrast that we use in arthrography. So there's two types of arthrography. There's direct and indirect. Direct is where you put contrast into the joint, which is the kind we're going to focus on. There's also another kind which fell out of favor, but it kind of alludes to what you asked regarding intravenous contrast, where we give intravenous contrast, we wait a little while, and we wait for that contrast to diffuse into the joint. Not really going to focus on indirect arthrography. We're going to kind of focus on the one that most people know as direct arthrography. And if we think about what happens when we put that contrast in the joint, that joint is now under a little bit of pressure. So things that are torn, things that are separated, now will separate even more, right? We're forcing contrast into the area of a tear that otherwise might have been, you know, kind of sit the two flaps might have been sitting on top of each other. So just by putting contrast into the joint itself, we can express fluid, we can force fluid into the side of the tear to make it more apparent. In addition, that bright signal is brighter than what we would see in a normal native hip, that bright signal that is abnormal in the labrum, and it's going to be much more apparent to us. So that's why arthrography in general offers better imaging. Having said that, there are caveats to whether or not it performs better. And there are a couple things, and, and, and I'll mention them kind of one by one. So Number one, it depends upon the training of the radiologist. And this is not a pretentious statement. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm a fellowship trained muscle radiologist, but they're in the literature, it does show, and I only mention this because you never know who's going to read the MRI. And it's important to know your local radiologist. They may, it doesn't have to be a muscular radiologist, but as long as you, you know their level and their kind of comfort with these things, that influences what you're going to see in a report and how you're going to treat your patient. So there, in the literature, it does show that muscular radiologists read at a higher sensitivity and specificity than general radiologists. When it comes to arthrography, in general, muscular radiologists read non-arthrographic MRI at a higher sensitivity and specificity. With arthrography, it doesn't change muscle radiologist reading that much, but with general radiologists, they do better with arthrography versus non-arthrographic studies. So if you have a general radiologist reading a you know hip and you want to get the best bang for your buck in terms of sensitivity and specificity, doing a contrast in its arthrogram, a contrast, direct contrast arthrogram is probably going to perform better. And again, it's very dependent upon the training of the radiologist. In addition, the field strength or Tesla of the MRI machine is also important. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning 
a 1.5 Tesla magnet is not half as good as a three Tesla magnet. It unfortunately doesn't work that way. It depends on the actual manufacturer, how old the machine is, the coils, et cetera. But in general, as a generalization, the higher the Tesla machine, the better images potentially could look. But again, that's very dependent on many factors. The protocol use is also important. There's a sequence, an axial oblique that we use in the hip that is shown to be much more sensitive and specific than a true axial, meaning the axial that is along the anatomy of the patient rather than an oblique axial, which is parallel to the femoral neck. That also influences the performance. So if we take all these things together, and let's say we have an ideal scenario, an MRI being read by a muscular radiologist, axial oblique planes with small field of view, high field magnet. In that scenario, arthrography probably is not necessary for labral pathology. If a patient has a large body mass index, that also decreases the imaging quality. So there might be some cases where you may suggest contrast, but in that general scenario, contrast is not usually indicated. For a general radiologist reading on a 1.5 Tesla magnet, larger patient, contrast can often be helpful. Now, there's another population where we do give contrast routinely or we do perform arthrograms routinely. That is post-surgical patients. Typically, the post-surgical labrum is never going to look normal. So having that bright signal that can really bring out things or can go into sites of new tears or recurrent tears, that can be very helpful. So we'll kind of separate the post-surgical patients because in general, m arthrography is very useful in that population for both the non-surgical patients. I would go based on kind of what I just said. And I apologize. Uh, I, I don't know if there's another part to that question that I missed. No, that was it. That was perfect. Okay. Yeah, I, I just asked, if, yeah, just to touch on the IV contrast because that was always an issue. And, and with my group, it was spine. You know, you've had spine surgery, instrumentation or no, do you use IV contrast? And for a long time they did, and then it kind of went away. So that's indirect arthrography. And indirect arthrography, the, the concept is you give into a you you inject it into a, a the patient, it goes through the the you know the veins, it gets to the joint, it diffuses into the joint, and then technically it increases the signal intensity in the joint flu, which can then go into tears. But one big negative is that there's no, you don't have the same pressure pushing that fluid into the site of a tear that you do with direct arthrography. Also, anytime we can avoid giving contrast is better. The amount of contrast you're giving for an intravenous injection is higher than that that you're giving for a direct injection into the joint. So it fell out of favor for many reasons, but those are the primary reasons. Next on the list, muscle strains. And you've mentioned, uh, you know, about skeletal muscle being your baseline and trying to make a distinction between acute and subacute injuries. And you talked about the blood products uh, that go along with this. Would you mind please telling our listeners your thoughts on muscle strains and how the imaging works? For muscular imaging, we use a grading system one through three, but it also corresponds to the pathoetiology of muscle tears. So in grade one strains, we're we see kind of small little areas of edema within the muscle itself, usually going along the what we're called the kind of the penations or where the muscle fibers attach to a, to a central tendon or an aporosis. That is just going to appear as bright on a fluid sensitive sequence. So we're just seeing bright signal on a fluid sensitive sequence in muscle. I'll mention kind of uh, going back to the myotennis unit in a second, uh, because that's, that's a very important distinction. But in general, we're seeing bright signal muscle. However, in grade one injuries, there's no architectural distortion. The, the, the architecture of that muscle is preserved. When we get to grade two strains, now we're talking about partial thickness tear. So we have that edema, that bright signal on a fluid sense sequence in the muscle belly. But now we actually have some architectural distortion or irregularity of the architecture of that muscle because there's been a partial thickness tear. There's been disruption of fibers of that muscle, but it's not complete. And that leads to grade three. Grade three is where the muscle is completely disrupted. You usually have a fluid cleft going right through the muscle. You know, pectoralis, I think I showed uh, on, on that lecture, but, you know, we see it in the quad. We see it all over the place. And that's kind of how we grade things now. It's important to kind of revisit something we talked about in terms of the weakest link in muscles uh, from the myotennis unit and getting going from bone to muscle. The weakest link in adults is going to be the myotennis junction. That's important for imaging for, for a specific reason. That is where the bright signal is has to match the patient. And what I mean by that is in a patient comes in, they have trauma and they have a muscle injury. I'm expecting that I will see it in the myotennis junction. When I don't, it gives me pause and I need to take a step back and say, could this be something else? And I believe in, in that lecture, I showed an example of, of a case where it was a shoulder. And in the shoulder, we had this bright signal throughout the entire muscle. So it wasn't just the myotennis junction. It was the muscle belly all the way to the myotennis junction. 
that is not typical for a strain. That is not that is not typical for traumatic pathology. We need to start thinking of other things. Denervation atrophy can do that. Myositis can do that. A diabetic myopathy can do that. We, there are a lot of things that can do that. So, in addition to those gradings, you know, and how we're you know, and what we're looking for in imaging, where in the muscle these abnormalities are is also pretty critical. If someone comes in and they had trauma, even if they had trauma and I see muscle diffusely, unless they had a direct impact injury that could have accounted for that abnormal distribution throughout the entire muscle rather than just at the myotennis junction, I need to start thinking of other things. In terms of, of grading these things and aging these things, I talked about subacute blood earlier. And subacute blood, fortunately for us, most patients that get an MRI don't injure themselves and then jump right into an MRI. They, they have to go somewhere and see someone, get referred to the MRI. As a result of that, most of the blood that we see on muscle skeletal MRI is in the subacute stage, right? It takes them a day or two. It takes them maybe a week to get an MRI. And fortunately, subacute blood is bright on T1. It's one of the, the few things we focus on on T1 that is bright, fat being one of the other things. So if we have a muscle strain, and we see bright T1 signal in that muscle, we know that there's subacute blood. And what does that tell us? Well, you don't get blood in a muscle without architectural distortion. And architectural distortion is at least a grade two. So when we see subacute blood or bright T1 in a muscle, we know we're dealing with at least a partial thickness tear, at least a grade two strain. So, you know, kind of putting all these things together, we're looking for abnormal signal in a fluid sensitive sequence, being, you know, the edema. If we get architectural distortion, that's a partial thickness tear. If we get complete disruption, that's grade three, a full thickness tear. And on a T1, again, I mentioned that T2 is the pathology sequence, but that's not always true. On a T1, if we see bright T1 in the muscle that's injured, that is at least a partial thickness tear, at least a grade two injury, because subacute blood does not occur without architectural distortion, without disrupting those blood vessels. Great. Thank you for that description. And again, listeners, there will be some images on our YouTube channel that kind of demonstrate what Dr. Silverberg is talking about. If we had a takeaway, uh, you know, just summarizing kind of in general, you know, think about the orthopedic PA that ordered the rotator cuff study and they're looking at it or looking for the ACL or the fracture. Just in general, are there some key points that you would say, think about this, think about that, do this? Sure, absolutely. And I think First and foremost, you know, going back to that concept of we're, we're not treating an image, we're treating a patient. What's on a report has to match, or what, what you see has to really match the patient. It's easy to look at an image and say, I see something abnormal there, and I'm going to just call that pathology. But if we take a step back and we think about you know, things like the mechanostat theory, mechanism of injury, how did this happen? What has that bone been uh, exposed to? What stress? Is it chronic? Is it acute? Looking at things from that perspective and trying to work through your algorithm, however you go through a study doesn't matter as long as you go through it the same way every time, but working through your algorithm and saying, okay, well, I see this. Does that fit? That's a great way to start imaging. When we get into sequences, it's important to kind of just remember fluid sensitive sequences in general are going to be your pathology sequence because of edema and hemorrhage associated with most injuries. Your T1 is great, you know, for anatomy, but also don't forget that medullary fat is our friend. And if it's replaced, we start to worry. And then while we're looking at those sequences, it's really important to become comfortable with more than just one plane. If you have your go-to sequence and you feel confident with it, that's an excellent thing. It, it really probably benefits the patient to be comfortable with that one plane and be very comfortable. Going a little further can really be helpful. It, it's, it's often uncomfortable to do things that we don't do frequently. I encourage everyone to just really find another plane that you can you can really focus on to, to get comfortable with. And, and again, you know, being in the shoulder, most people don't get comfortable with the sagittal. I think things like the, the three stooges approach are helpful. And there's many others from the other joints. With regard to pediatric patients, you know, one takeaway is, again, there are so many variants that mimic pathology. One thing to do is that you should always consider, could this be one of those variants? And Google's your friend. We have the internet now. You can easily just say, is there a developmental variant in this bone, this thing that looks like that? I mean, it's there, it's accessible. It's just important to at least keep that in the back of your head because a lot of these things get overcalled. You know, for example, you know, overcalling an osteochondral lesion in a pediatric patient, if that patient is then non weight bearing or is taken out of sports unnecessarily, it may seem like a small thing, but that can potentially have some, some impact. I think that's it. I mean, I, I certainly I think, you know, getting comfortable with your local radiologist is great. It, it can be an excellent resource, especially if you have fellowship trained muscle radiologists in your area and you have to work with them. 
we they were kind of outnumbered in radiology when it comes to to the total number of radiologists. But it's important to to kind of understand their thought process, how they work. You know, they can help you to 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 learn as you go, and I think it, it can be an excellent relationship. But my suggestion would be, you know, kind of just don't look at us as you know, kind of report generators. Look at us as kind of colleagues and and teammates, and that's what we're here for. And that's why I enjoy teaching. Is that it really is helpful for us to kind of understand you know, that these are just images and that, you know, we're treating, we're not treating them as an image, we're treating the patient. These apps happen to be images of that patient. Absolutely. And, and I've told students that many times as well. And it's also helpful for listeners that are sending patients for MRI, give a little bit of a history. You know, you don't have to give a book, but give a history of what happened and what's going on, what you're looking for. And that kind of helps our radiologist colleagues to determine what it is. And don't just say knee hurts, you know, knee pain. Well, that could be anything, you know, was there trauma, was there not, that sort of thing. And, and I think that's very helpful. Dr. Silverberg, I want to tell you, thank you so much for being on today. And I do want to ask one last question. Sure. If I'm your green as grass first year resident coming in and I want to know, you know, MSK imaging techniques, samples of images, what would be a great reference for me to go to? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. And, and there's so many. And I guess it depends on uh, because it's modality specific, X-ray, CAT scan or CT or, or MRI or even nuclear medicine. For MRI, there's an excellent book. And I believe it, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's several editions of it. It was written, uh, I have to look it up, but it, it's called MRI of the Muscular System. And I think it's Clyde Helms and either B.J. Manister or a very a very well-known uh, female muscular radiologist whose name I should know uh, wrote the book. But it's an excellent book. And I can, I can email you the name of it. But it's, it's great because it's, it's simplified. But honestly, if you know everything in that book, you'll be a pro for MRI. With regard to plain films and CAT scan, that's a little bit more challenging because the books dedicated to just CT and the musculoskeletal system are kind of specific and they're combined in other chapters. And I think for that, it's probably best just to work with your local radiologist. There are definitely x-ray uh, books you know, that cover musculoskeletal imaging, but they're, again, usually coupled with more broader uh, things. For, for residents that come in, I think there are, are dedicated radiology series. I think one is a core curriculum. Another one is called the requisites. They're good. They might be a little much and a little too much and maybe not worth the time, to be honest, for, for someone. But I think those are also decent resources. And then, of course, like I said, just putting in a plug again, your local muscle radiologists have to work with you. A lot of us do teaching. A lot of us like teaching. And we learn from you as well. So it, it can be a really beneficial you know, kind of symbiotic relationship. Dr. Silverberg, thank you so much. And for our listeners that would like to see Dr. Silverberg's presentation at our conference, again, it'll be on our website soon, uh, where you can go to the members, can go to the Learning Center. Very excited to have it on. And hey, you know what? I hope I can have you on again, because this has been fantastic. Very Pleasure. I appreciate it. Very informative. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited. So thank Likewise, you so much for your time. Likewise. Thank you guys. And I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully work with you guys again soon. Listeners, follow along on our YouTube channel. We'll have several images of Dr. Silverberg's talk that correlate with the podcast, so please follow along there. And for our listeners that would like to see Dr. Silverberg's presentation at our conference, again, it'll be on our website soon. Our annual meeting this year is called Ortho and Indy. It's from August 21st through August 25th. The venue is the JW Marriott. Not only do we have world-class speakers, we have workshops, optional mini sessions, food, social events. There's just tons of things going on. We hope to see you there.